Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. This is uh, Romano Lasker. I work with UNDP, uh, the United Nations Development Program in New York. I'm in the Crisis Bureau, uh, and I'm working on something that we're calling the Humanitarian Development and Peace Nexus, which is the subject of our panel today, where we will examine this new trend that we could call uh, the, the HDP Nexus and how uh, it impinges on humanitarian principles um, and in the way that we are working and trying to resolve crises uh, for so many millions of people that are suffering today. Uh, before I introduce the panel, I'm just going to give a quick overview on the nexus itself. And you may be wondering why right in front of you, I put two pictures, one of uh, a sushi roll and one of an avocado. And the reason for me is simple. Uh, what we see here are, uh, are two objects or two foods, you could say, that are composed of three components. Uh, one at the center, uh, for, so for the sushi roll, it's the salmon and the avocado, uh, protected by a, another layer, uh, in this case the rice, and then encased in, in the seaweed. And we see the same with the avocado, where you have the kernel of the seed, uh, then with the green areas that are the cushion, and then with an outer protective layer of, uh, uh, of the skin. And we see this as a very good metaphor for the humanitarian development peace nexus itself, in the sense that what we need to do right at the center is to protect development. It's the human right that we all have that we can strive for more. It is the objectives that we have put into the sustainable development goals. But to do that, we have to make sure that we are also protecting it. And we protect it at times with humanitarian aid, which is the soft bits, the white rice or the, or the green uh, avocado itself. And to protect all of that even further, to protect that cushion, we have the skin or the seaweed. And that to me is an encapsulation uh, or uh, 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 an analogy that I would like you to bear in mind as we discuss the issue of the HTP nexus. Oops, sorry. Um, so all of you are logged in today. So I hope this is working. No. Not sure why this isn't working. Okay, all of you are logged in today uh, because you work somewhat in the aid industry. And when wherever you work or whoever you work with, usually you have one level of concentration. You might be a humanitarian aid worker, you might work in development, you might work in peace um, and try to resolve crises or prevent crises. All of us are trying to work around the same issues that are kind of universal, and they're universal in the SDGs, which is that wheel that you see right at the center, the Sustainable Development Goals. I'm not going to go much into detail about this. It is something that I assume that you guys all know, but it's important for us to understand that regardless of what we label ourselves, we're actually all heading towards a similar type of uh, objective in, time, in terms of trying to make things better for everybody and realize that we all have areas to improve. I'm also not going to go into the details of what is the nexus approach, um, which is uh, what's going to be somewhat discussed today. Uh, but I want to leave these slides available to both ICRC and MSF to share with all of the participants so that they can then go into more detail and are able to ask us as the panelists questions, or they can reach out to us separately uh, via email. But long story short, we all realize that we're all different, we're doing three different types of work on the humanitarian development and peace side. And what we need to do is to be able to do it better together so that it coincides in a way that is coherent, that is efficient and somehow prioritizes prevention uh, in order for development to be possible and in order and only to have humanitarian actions when it is absolutely necessary. Uh, in many ways, I feel that the humanitarian development peace nexus is somewhat like working as a management consultancy for the aid system, where we're just trying to tell all of these actors, all of whom 
are trying to do the best that they can to just act and interact in a better way. Fundamentally, the way we as UNDP have seen the HDP Nexus approach, and it is something that has been replicated in different forums, including the OECD DAC, uh, including in the humanitarian community, the peace community, the development community, and also amongst all member states that, that have agreed to it at the United Nations, it basically looks at improving three areas of our work. One is to improve how we coordinate. The second is how we program better. And finally, how this is underpinned by better financing. And all in all, what we hope to see, and I'll skip this, what we'll hope to see is uh, essentially an aid system that is more coherent, that is more interoperable and fit for purpose, that is more efficient with the resources that we have and effective in uh, programming to tackle the deteriorating, uh, uh, the deterioration well-being for the most vulnerable. I'll leave it at that for now in terms of uh, the presentation itself. But what I wanted to do was uh, have the honor of uh, presenting the panelists that we have today. And what I would say from the outset is we have a broad spectrum of panelists uh, from within the Red Cross movement with uh, Maki Iragashi, who is the head of the IFRC delegation in Papua New Guinea. We have Colin Bruce from the ICRC. He's the special envoy for humanitarian and development affairs. We have uh, Ella Watson Stryker, who is with the Médecins Sans Frontières, MSF in Washington. Um, we have Giorgia Nicatore, who works with uh, Interpeace, uh, an NGO working on peace uh, responsive programming based out of Geneva. And we were also supposed to have Mr. Koji Sakane, who works with JICA in Sudan. I first of all need to apologize uh, for his absence today. Uh, as you may know, there is uh, serious fighting going on in Sudan right now and in the capital Khartoum. He is safe. Fortunately, he is able to communicate, but he is not able to be with us today. One final point I would say about this panel is that it truly reflects the nexus, because the nexus in a way is not only about who amongst these panelists are humanitarian development or peace, but it's also about the different types of actors. There's actors who are at the regional, global, or field level, there's actors that are working for a bilateral agency, an NGO or a UN agency. And this complex system of different types of actors doing different types of work, yet still heading in the same direction, is the complexity and the knot that we are trying to untie when it comes to the nexus itself. I have the honor now to pass the floor to Miss. Uh, uh, Igarashi san in, uh, um, in Papua New Guinea uh, for her uh, opening remarks. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you very much, Romana, for the amazing introduction and also the opening remarks. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Maki Igarashi, uh, now currently the Papua New Guinea as a head of country delegation for IFRC, International Federation of Red Cross Recrescent uh, Societies. And also, this is a really great honor to uh, be with this great panels uh, today. So today, um, I'm going to talk about a couple of points. Uh, so based on that um, presentation here, and also the, based on the Romano's uh, um, introduction, opening remarks. So IFRC, we are the membership organization uh, with 192, basically the headquarters in Geneva, with 192 national societies, Red Cross and Red Crescent in 192 countries and areas with 14 million volunteers. So today we are the Red Cross Red Crescent movement, respect uh, the fundamental principles, as you can see on the screen, humanity, impartiality, neutrality, unity, independence, 
voluntary service and universality. Especially, we cannot compromise uh, to uh, impartiality, no discrimination, neutrality, retain a credi credibility by not taking side, and also independence, autonomy with respect to the all power for the humanity and also deliver our humanitarian aid and also a, a hum a development mission. Uh, second slide. Second point that humanitarian ne nexus is well discussed with commitment at higher level, but there is still a significant gap in, in implementation on the ground in the communities. We should be aware that the most vulnerable population in communities often overlooked or forgotten during the resource allocation or program implementation. These overlooked population may be nations, regions, or communities. Ensuring that we maintain our neutrality and impartiality will help create trust and maintain our humanitarian access and the development work. However, there is a need for more multi-year and the flexible funding to be able to implement sustainability, high-level plans that achieve that uh, desired impact. For instance, in Lebanon, Lebanese Red Cross, despite its having very good humanitarian access and a strong volunteer network, due to high levels of trust developed over the past uh, 75 years of impartial and neutral support to all people in need, even during the war. Even Lebanese Red Cross has facing some challenges in implementation programs due to lack of available resources. Amid of recent four major ongoing crises, one of the biggest refugee crises, the Syrian refugee crisis, COVID-19 pandemic, economic collapse, this is the, according to World Bank ranks, among the most severe, severe one and globally. And Beirut port explosion in 2020 to, to provide humanitarian support to all people in need. Third point, development should be part of humanitarian response. Population who are left behind or neglected to the, during the, uh, national, uh, sorry, natural, national uh, development program are more vulnerable to the effect of emergencies. They will lack the resilience of more favorable populations who may have received preferable treatment in allocation of services. It is critical that all populations, regardless of political, political, religious, gender, age, tribal, ethnicity, receive equitable developmental support build their resilience. Many humanitarian responses are protracted. It is unsustainable and unfeasible to maintain and continue humanitarian work and ensuring peace without investing in localization and developing community resilience and secure access to food, water, health, education, security, and development uh, em em sorry, em empower, uh, employment and uh, livelihood. Uh, Papua New Guinea, currently I'm in, is an example of a country where populations are incredibly vulnerable to the many localized emergencies, such as flood tide, earthquakes, volcanoes, landslide, and the general effect of climate change, as well as uh, inter intersane conflict and the civil unrest. Since the level of the development and access to basic social services are pro and, and programs are so low. Lastly, but at least, our humanitarian action and development work should not be media or political driven. Our planning implementation, planning and implementation should be based on evidence and humanitarian need. The Ukraine crisis is currently one of the the worst humanitarian crisis and then naturally receive a lot of media attention, which influenced donor fund allocation as well as public interest to con continue providing fund. In contrast, Syria, 
Chile is facing a major challenge for humanitarian rights dignity due to lack of available resources. A drop in dropping media attention, donor interest and fatigue, and the public donation has led to a lack of funds support. Support the reconstruction and recovery from 12 years of conflict, economic crisis, as well as a effective ongoing humanitarian emergency response. City Arab Crescent pain free has had to close many of their clinics, reduce their mobile medical and ambulance services due to lack of resources caused by reasons mentioned above before. A lack of medi medical facilities and capacities severely impacted on the agile humanitarian response to the major earthquake earlier in the year, but City Arab Crescent society is existing capacity and a good access throughout that country with the neighboring system societies, the immediate cooperation, a strong volunteer network could manage to provide humanitarian response to the earthquake affected population effectively impartially. For um, triple nexus, it is fundamental for us to respect and implement the fundamental principles for delivering a humanitarian aid and also the uh, development um, work to all without no one left behind with 192 national societies and 40 million volunteers. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Igarashi-san, and thank you for the work that you are doing, not only in Papua New Guinea right now, but also in the past. I think you've made a, a really strong link to the issue of humanitarian principles and the need for us to really be as life-saving as possible, first and foremost. And I think what we will see from uh, the coming presentations is also the complexity of how you do life-saving work in a protracted crisis where yes, you are saving lives, but are you also perpetuating perhaps uh, a humanitarian type of response when perhaps uh, different types of responses are required for us to get out of the crisis to begin with. Um, I wanted to pass the floor on to uh, Ella. I think she has to step out uh, for a brief moment. If I could ask Colin, if I could ask you to come in from ICRC, and then we will come back to uh, Ella in a second as soon as she's back online. Uh, Colin, Bruce, over to you. Uh, greetings, everyone. I am deeply honored to be a part of this conversation and I really look forward to the interactions we will have, not only as panelists, but also from those in our virtual audience. I'm Colin Bruce. My title is that of Special Envoy for Humanitarian and Development Affairs at the ICRC. And it's great that I'm going to follow uh, Miki, uh, Maki, sorry, in her presentation. She is with the International Federation of the Red Cross. And we are proud members of the movement, the Red Movement, as we call it. ICRC, however, has a very specific mandate. It was uh, the, the original Red Cross uh, set up in uh, 1863. So we are now celebrating our 160th birthday. Um, and our focus is exclusively and emphatically on situations affected by conflict. I'm coming to you from Washington, D.C., because we were just here with our president to discuss our collaboration with institutions like the World Bank. But if you ever come to Geneva, you will see a very large display at our headquarters, which says, even wars have rules. So we operate in the conflict space. And we operate based on the Geneva Conventions and different statutes that have been adopted by members, uh, member states. And our focus is on ensuring that wars have a minimum uh, disruptive and damaging impact on people. So that's our mandate. We have both a prevention mandate a protection mandate and an assistance mandate. The prevention mandate largely has to do with uh, ensuring that 
those who are parties to a conflict observe their obligations under international humanitarian law. Um, our protection mandate has to do with helping uh, the, those who are affected in terms of uh, ensuring that the detained that uh, are, are supported, that families that are separated can be reunited, and so on and so forth, and that states meet their obligations to protect uh, people. And then our assistance, of course, very much driven by the emergencies with which we enter into these situations. And to be able to deliver on that spectrum of obligations, which are rooted, as I said, in international humanitarian law, uh, we have about 23 uh, colleagues around the world in over 100 countries. We remain present throughout all cycles of conflict. And we are often present on the front lines of conflict. So that's uh, sort of the first point I want to make, the first of five points about the ICRC and how we approach the question of the nexus. Because the mandate point that I made uh, as the first point and the modus operandi point, those are central to understanding the pragmatic and yet principled approach that we take to the nexus. My second point, which is already on the screen, is that part of the reality that we have to grapple with is that even as an emergency organization, uh, according to development initiatives out of the UK, 75% of the people who need humanitarian assistance are in situations of protracted conflict. Likewise, we know from our own research and that of a number of others that conflicts tend to arise in situations that have already had conflict. And that all of this is the main driver of humanitarian need. And what that means is that even as we immerse ourselves in our emergency mandate, we are operating among people, affected peoples, who themselves have to deal with not only the consequences of the emergency, but they also have to deal with the fact that these emergencies often morph into a really prolonged uh, a situation of need, of vulnerability, of risks. And in fact, based on fairly rough estimates of our own sort of operational footprint and operational portfolio, uh, some uh, data, and this is preliminary, suggests that over 60% of what we do is in the protracted conflict space, simply because of the nature of the context in which we um, operate. And that's the second point I really, really want to emphasize. And what that means practically, for example, uh, is that if we come into a situation where we need to do water trucking or we need to do boreholes, that's the emergency intervention. But if we have to be there for 30 years and 40 years, we can not continue to do boreholes especially when so much more conflict is occurring in urban areas where you need to be thinking about urban systems and so on. So that's the sort of practical implication of the context in which we operate. We are an emergency of, uh, actor, but when we enter, we tend to stay. I think our estimate is that of, of our largest programs, our 10 largest programs, we've been there for over 40 years. And so this challenge of what we do in response to the needs of people is one that brings us squarely into the conversation about the nexus. My third point has to do with, given our mandate, given the context that I've just elaborated, what is the appropriate uh, approach for a principled organization? And uh, my colleague, Maki, elaborated very eloquently on the fundamental principles. Those are ones that we also embrace. We have a policy uh, which is called accountability to affected peoples, meaning that we engage them 
as we try to understand their needs. And of course, all of us on this call know that people do not differentiate between you know, what they need today and what they need tomorrow, at least in a sense, they don't uh, differentiate between who provides it, what they have are needs, needs that are immediate, needs that uh, uh, present themselves and continue to exist over a long period of time. And just to illustrate that dramatically, at least for me, when I came from my background in development, I was once at a refugee camp and I was uh, stunned to be met by people who were born in the refugee camp, who grew up in the refugee camps, who got married in the refugee camps, who were having children in the refugee camps. And so when you think of the life cycle of a person in that situation, which began as an emergency, one has to think of all the things that they will need to have a life of dignity. So our approach is written is, is anchored and, and it's written up based on that uh, reality of what people need and as an institution that feels accountable to them. And frankly, we need to be accountable also to enjoy their trust. And we need to enjoy their trust because we also need them to give us access um, to be able to meet needs. We have an approach which involves what we call looking for sustainable humanitarian impact. So we remain true to our humanitarian identity. We uh, also uh, embrace our principles, which means at times we will say no, because we feel they are in violation. Um, we try to be very clear about where we have value. So the fact that we are present doesn't mean that we will necessarily intervene. Uh, but we must be clear that we are adding value. And then, of course, we are a protection-oriented organization. That's our core mandate. And so we also look at protection outcomes. I, I characterize this third point as our evolving approach because we've been at this now in earnest for about five years. So there's a lot that we have done, but there's a lot that we are still learning. And I really do want to emphasize that. My fourth point, and then I will end with a fifth point that talks about the challenges, which is the core element of this uh, segment. We have sort of a few components that we uh, normally identify as part of this collaboration that we have. So uh, to, to, to remind us, we are a humanitarian organization recognizing that for us to be able to make progress we must be not only meeting needs, but trying to reduce needs and giving people a dignified life. To do that, we have to partner with others whose mandate is complementary to ours. And so we form relationships with development and other actors, and those relationships have a few components. The first is a sort of knowledge and expertise exchange. Um, and this is where we make our expertise available to inform and to influence what others do. Uh, and perhaps one of the most uh, significant examples of that is some of the work we're doing now on climate and conflict and trying to ensure that as we go to these various COPs and as there are discussions about mitigation and about uh, adaptation, and about different green funds and so on, that those countries that are affected by conflict that often have very limited uh, absorptive capacity and often find it difficult to meet the requirements that they are not left behind in this discussion. Um, so it's an example of how our presence on the ground, our presence outside of capitals, our large footprint allows us to draw in real examples and insights into what some of these issues mean. We also have lots of engineers, we have physicians, uh, we have a whole range um, of uh, different uh, uh, skill sets. So that's our approach. We also have diplomacy and then we do specific projects with different partners. And my final point has to do with some of the challenges. And I want to just highlight briefly some of them. One is the authorizing environment. You know, we have our core donors, 
we have staff, and we uh, have to be constantly explaining to them what we're doing, why we're doing it, how are we are protecting our NIHA. I'm here in Washington, D.C. I just met with PRM uh, in the U.S. government. Again, just to keep this open dialogue so that they know what we're doing, we have to do it with staff, we have to do it with others. A second challenge has to do with organizational readiness. You know, working with others is challenging in terms of systems and a number of other considerations. We have to be continuously learning. And the final point I have to say, given that we're all concerned about principles and about maintaining our um, identity and neutrality, all of those things, is that there's tremendous power in saying no. We have said no to several partners who have expressed an interest in working with us simply because we felt that we could not do so in all good faith and maintain our principles. So that's a quick overview of what we in ICRC are doing. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Colin, and immensely grateful for your uh, presentation uh, and for your points and to show that even an organization that is 160 years old uh, is somehow still continuously striving and evolving um, and trying to adjust to the realities of today. Again, this is a multipolar world where there are crises that are not as simple, perhaps, as, as it was during the Cold War or as we perceived it to be during the Cold War. Um, and where the dynamics of what public and private institutions do, government and non-state uh, authorities uh, are doing, all of this put a lot of uh, questions in place in terms of how we as aid actors, regardless of whether we're, we are humanitarian development or peace, can best operate on the ground. And certainly it impinges on principles, which is the, the, the basic thing that we want to try and discuss today. And one of the questions that will come to us, for example, is uh, what is seen to be principled financing? Um, you know, who is it that we should be receiving funds from and can take it in what we, in a manner that we think is ethical in order for us to be able to operate? Um, and Japan, of course, is a strong donor and a strong uh, provider of overseas of an official development uh, assistance. And everything that they do is recorded through the OECD DAC. Um, yet this is not uh, the sole source of financing that we have uh, in um, development or in crisis in general. Um, yet it's somehow perceived to be by us as being the most neutral. But even those things can come into question when some of these same donors may be party to a conflict, for example, in a direct or an indirect manner. Uh, with that, I have the honor to pass the floor to Ella Watson Stryker, uh, who, as I mentioned, is with MSF, uh, the Médecins Sans Frontières, in uh, the Washington office. Ella, over to you. Hey, thank you. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Um, thank you, Colin, for flexibility. Sometimes working for an emergency organization means that uh, we have to deal with emergencies even in the midst of talking about them. So luckily I was able to resolve that. Um, indeed, I am working for MSF, Doctors Without Borders, and I am in Washington, D.C. as the humanitarian representative to the U.S. government. So I'm working out of our international office as part of an international team and um, and here as the um, as the representative. And trying to start slides. OK, um, can you nod if you can see my slides? Did I do it correctly? OK, good. Um, so from. Um, for MSF, the nexus is um, is actually quite a different situation. So we are um, we are a principled medical humanitarian emergency response organization. We're not a development organization. We're not a peace building organization. We've stayed really close to that initial mandate of being the emergency medical responder. And this means that our work is really focused on a much narrower um, set of goals and deliverables. And we're really focused on emergency settings. We are guarded, guided by medical ethics and principles of neutrality, impartiality, and independence. And these are really important to us. They grew out of um, MSF's 
um, origins in, in the Red Cross movement. Um, and we've added to that an element of bearing witness or um for, for French speakers. When, um, and I wanna be clear, MSF is a very large entity. I can't by any means manage to cover all of the, the opinions and viewpoints on the nexus of the entire MSF, but I'll try to, to cover them um, in, in, in sort of the major opinions. Um, in terms of the issue of independence or that principle of independence, that's very specific in MSF. We've really, and Romano, you set me up well for this, um, we've really focused on a level of financial independence that I think is a bit unique to the point that MSF does not take any funding from the US government or most large governments. So in 2021, um, I checked, that was the most recent I could find. Um, we took money from three governments from Japan, Canada, and Switzerland. And those are less than 2% than, um, of our total income. So it's a really small percent of our income is coming from governments. We're really focused on providing um, as independent of medical care as possible. And that means um, not relying on governments. Um, the other element that I wanna touch on in the beginning is this idea of principled humanitarian aid. And that's really a distinct way of responding to emergencies. It's um, recognized under the Geneva Conventions. And if you are working um, in a principled way, you have specific legal protections under, the, under international humanitarian law, which is rooted in those Geneva Conventions. And that, that protection is how MSF can work in a complex setting. It's how we can send doctors and nurses and other humanitarian professionals into a war zone with the expectation that we will be protected, that our patients in our hospitals, our structures, our vehicles will be protected because it's understood we're not part of the conflict, that we are there only to provide medical care. We're not serving the objectives or the interests of either side to the, to the violence, to the conflict. And it's really important to understand that that is, that is stipulated in the Geneva Conventions. International humanitarian aid can't serve the objectives of a military, you will lose your protected status. So um, with that understanding, you can imagine this could at times create a tension between what MSF is trying to do and a government if the government is party to the conflict. We might be providing medical aid to a population that the government doesn't want to receive aid. Um, they might be trying to destroy that population. And so this is where sometimes it can be um, quite challenging for humanitarian actors and where those, those principles of neutrality, and partial, impartiality, and independence are incredibly important to protecting the safety um, of our staff and our patients. Um, and then I also want to make the point that, that um, this issue of humanitarian, I often say the capital H humanitarian rather than the lowercase humanitarian, because a lot of times we use humanitarian, um, at least in the English language, to, to talk about someone who's being kind. And so a celebrity might be humanitarian. And that's not what we're talking about in MSF. We're really talking about humanitarian action that is protected under international humanitarian law. So when we look at MSF's reaction to the triple nexus, um, I think we surprised a lot of people in 2016 when we decided to pull out of the World Humanitarian Summit. And at the time, MSF released a press release that said, we were pulling out because we felt that the summit wasn't taking place in good faith, that essentially there was already a predetermined outcome. It's not something that would be discussed at the summit. Instead, the, the various um, humanitarian organi organizations at the summit would be presented with this new way of working or what we now are calling humanitarian development peace nexus. And, um, and essentially it was a get on board, um, you have to join this, um, this framework. Specifically, and in, in sort of the initial reaction um, that MSF took was to look at how the framework was being presented. And there is um, a, a focus on collective outcomes, um, which the Nexus was describing as commonly agreed measurable results or impact in reducing people's needs, risks, and vulnerabilities and increasing their resilience. And this is really not what MSF is trying to do. These are good things to do. We're not against any of this, but it's not the goal of humanitarian aid. 
So in humanitarian aid, we're not trying to reduce people's needs, we're just trying to meet their needs. We're trying to save their lives and restore dignity. It's an emergency intervention. And, um, and that's, that's where it is. It, when you start to talk about reducing needs and risks and vulnerabilities and increasing resilience, you have start to move more into a political conversation that we don't wanna be part of. Um, the next element is that the time frame for the Nexus interventions includes a planning and funding cycle of three to five years in accordance with the Sustainable Development Goals. And I will come to the Sustainable Development Goals for 2030 um, in the next slide. But humanitarian aid really does have to be fast in order to save lives and flexible and able um, to, to adapt to dynamic contexts. The reality is um, you can think that you're going to work on a project to reduce people's needs but if that conflict escalates quickly, people are going to have increased needs, not reduced needs. And if your programming hasn't been set up in such a way that you can increase your response quickly, you won't be able to respond effectively in a humanitarian emergency. Um, so then more specifically, as time continued and MSF had more time to digest and, and, um, and think through the conceptual objections to the nexus, we come back to the sustainable development goals. And again, there's no problem with the sustainable development goals. The problem is that it's not humanitarian aid, it's development. And we worry that there's a, a risk that we're conflating the emergency needs of people with this idea of sustainability. Um, in the humanitarian approach is not sustainable. It's not meant to be. When people are hungry, we just need to feed them. Um, you can imagine if your house is knocked down in an earthquake, you don't wanna wait for a construction crew to come in and rebuild your house. Um, you want a temporary structure and that's okay. It doesn't have to be sustainable in that emergency mode that can come later. And so for MSF, we say, look, we're, we need to stay focused on our mandate, which is emergencies. We're not going to worry about if it's sustainable for the long-term because that's, that's something that governments really need to be responsible for. Um, and that comes to the issue of responsibilities of states towards populations in crisis. Um, at the time that in two, uh, 2016, at the time of that uh, humanitarian summit, MSF's hospitals um, were being bombed by many of the same states that were promoting this nexus approach. We were really um, under heavy fire in multiple locations where basic rules of international humanitarian law were not being respected and humanitarians were being put um, at high risk, we were being killed and our patients were being killed. Um, it also was when we saw huge waves of migra migrants, um, asylum seekers and refugees trying to reach Europe and the same states who were promoting the nexus approach were the states that were pushing people back um, and leaving them to drown in the Mediterranean Sea. And so we really thought this is an inappropriate um, moment to hand more power to donors um, when these donor states need to actually take a look at themselves and take more responsibility for how they are treating people in crisis. And then the third element was this idea of political dimensions of development and peace building, um, which I touched on, but it's really um, to make the point that for MSF, we have to stay outside of this idea of being the government's partner. We work alongside a government. We can share data and information and meet with governments, of course, um, but we don't work on behalf of a government. We don't work on behalf of a donor government. We don't work on behalf of the host government. We work on behalf of our patients. And it's really for us very important to maintain that strict distinction. Um, and then we came over, over the years to the practical objections to the nexus. And this is really based on what we observe and what we experience in um, delivering humanitarian aid. So the first element is this confusion between development and government partners, those who are working through the government to achieve their goals, and then humanitarian or non-political actors and security risks. We see increasingly that organizations are not engaged in effective negotiation, which is the basis for humanitarian um, emergencies. You have to talk to all sides of a conflict. You negotiate um, by talking about and explaining your humanitarian principles and, and you negotiate for a safe passage for um, the ability to work safely in that context. And instead we see increased reliance on armed um, escorts, increased 
reliance on governments or United Nations agencies to provide security. Um, and rather than humanitarian organizations being those direct um, interveners and, and negotiating on their own behalf. We also see that when governments are party to the conflict, this can re result in reduced access to populations in distress. So um, again, this idea that governments who are party to a conflict are going to have different interests. And we cannot be so naive as to think that they're going to always act in, on, in the best interest of all of the population um, in their control, particularly in, in a time of civil war. Um, the third element is this idea of risk aversion, which is becoming incredibly difficult um, in many, many of the places that MSF is working, where we see just a lack of humanitarian actors. We've seen, for example, shifts to development actors in Haiti mean that there just isn't an emergency response capacity in Haiti any longer. Um, we also see this push um, to localization which is part of, of the new way of working, part of the Nexus framework. But without doing proper risk assessment to understand what the risks are to local, um, local NGOs. And this can, can create one higher risk for, for nationals um, of a country who are emergency responders, but it can also mean that you see dumping of aid. So we say, for example, in Yemen, warehouses with humanitarian supplies that just weren't distributed because nobody um, felt that they had the security assurances to be able to distribute that aid. And so it's not helping anyone. Um, we see slower responses. We see fewer actors in emergencies. It's um, the risk aversion is a big threat to delivering humanitarian aid. Um, I think the, the increased power to donors and our concern about that um, point is, is um, well covered. But it does mean that people are making decisions in capital cities rather than making decisions on the ground um, in consultation with the populations in need. And then the, the longer time frames and reduced flexibility. Um, so this is my last slide. Um, I thought it would be nice to end on an illustration. Um, but the idea is that a combined approach may not be well adapted to emergency interventions. Um, and it would be hard to imagine the environment where a combined elephant and a combined, combined with a penguin would be um, comfortable in terms of, of the climate and environment. So thank you so much. I'm gonna stop there. Thank you so much, Ella. Uh, Thought provoking and certainly uh, put us into a bit of a difficult context. I myself was strongly involved in the World Humanitarian Summit from the OCHA side at that time. Um, and uh, it certainly caused a splash when MSF uh, decided to opt out. Um, what I would say from my perspective of having continued to work on the Nexus in general since then, is uh, the fact that the Nexus uh, actually put into question the definition of humanitarian and the definition of emergency, which are two terms that you used quite often in your slides themselves. Um, and it's not, uh, and I would say to a certain extent that MSF is using it in the pure manner, whilst perhaps the rest of the humanitarian community, as we call ourselves, seems to have a much more expansive definition of it that goes beyond life-saving alone. And that perhaps may be the crux of, of where we're having our, our differences today, um, but which we still need to somehow bridge to be able to actually address the root causes uh, of these uh, protracted crises in particular. Um, with that, uh, Ella, if I may then pass the floor on to Giorgia Nicatore in, uh, with Interpeace in Geneva. Georgia, the floor is over to you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Good, thanks. Um, I'm very honored actually as well to, to be part of this panel today. Uh, good morning and good afternoon and good evening as well to, to everyone. Um, I'm Georgia Nicatore and I work for Interpeace. Um, Interpeace is an international peace building organization that's been in existence now for about 30 years and um, has two facets to its mandate. Uh, the first facet of our mandate is work in, to work in conflict-affected settings to support societies to manage conflict in nonviolent ways. 
um, and to resolve conflicts. And uh, the second facet of our mandate is actually to work closely with the international community um, sort of writ large to increase efficiency and effectiveness of um, support and contributions to, to peace and sustainable peace. Um, the reason why I'm just giving, uh, giving a couple of, of seconds to the presentation of Interpeace is that I realize that uh, among the panel, of course, um, I think I may be the, well, I am, I am the only peace, uh, representing the only peace actor and uh, potentially one of the smaller, uh, smaller organizations as well. Uh, of, of the panel and the conversation today. Um, I'll focus my, my intervention for a few minutes actually just sort of on the, on the context uh, of where we're, we're at and some of these elements have already been, been shared by some of the panelists. Um, and then actually some of the challenges uh, that we perceive as, a, as peace building actors um, to sort of the HDP nexus and the implementation of the HDP nexus, uh, but particularly um, in regards to humanitarian action, and then maybe uh, some thoughts on opportunities that, that exist uh, and ways in which perhaps we can address and frame the conversation somewhat differently to find points of convergence. Um, I don't actually have a PowerPoint presentation, but um, I'll be as structured as I, as I possibly can so that uh, it's fairly clear. Um, and I, I realize that perhaps these are these are sort of new uh, new thoughts and concepts and, and require some reflection, because I think we know that the, the discourse um, on the HDP nexus and particularly the H and D, right? So the relationship between humanitarian and development has been a little bit more discussed, um, but the P, the piece in the nexus is uh, a little bit less. Actually, this is, I think, illustrated by the, the sushi and avocado that we saw earlier, I, I wonder where, where peace fits. Is it, are we protecting the humanitarian and, and development action or where is it? So I think that's uh, maybe a point for, for discussion. I also want to say from the outset that Interpeace is um, very cognizant and, un, and you know, acknowledges the fact that there are no easy answers to, to, this, to this conversation and that a lot of learning is still, still needs to be done by, by ourselves and, and others. So we are approaching this and I, I will be sharing our thoughts with, uh, with humility and, and, and an open mind. Um, we, we work in, in, in various settings across, across the world, world, currently mainly in Sub-Saharan Africa and the MENA region. Um, but we've also been running what uh, we call the Peace Responsiveness Program. Uh, and Peace Responsiveness essentially refers to the ability of different actors, uh, whether from the humanitarian development um, sectors to, to contribute to peace, to be conflict sensitive uh, and also find ways to, to contribute um, deliberately to, to sustainable peace. And this is because, and it was mentioned earlier, I think from, uh, from, from the colleagues, that we know that humanitarian needs occur where, where there is conflict, around 80% um, of, of those settings are, of, of humanitarian needs occur in, in conflict settings. And we actually also know from our own research and research that has been that has that is in existence and has been published that often aid and humanitarian support sometimes actually um, exacerbates conflicts rather than than solving and providing and providing support and needs. Um, sorry, and, and and answers to need. So we we have to ask ourselves difficult questions um, as to whether we we are conflict sensitive and are doing no harm to begin with um, in the delivery of our support um, and whether there's actually more to be done in order to for us to to maybe contribute to resolving some of the root causes of 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 these crises and conflicts as as Romano and others have also mentioned. Um, I think across the board we all commit to the principle of do no harm um, and conflict sensitivity by an extension of that. Um, but there's, I think, a couple of challenges related to it. Uh, one is that perhaps we narrowly interpret that to, to mean to understand it as you know, trying to avoid doing immediate harm in the delivery of, 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 of aid and support, and perhaps not taking a longer term perspective as to what kind of conditions and what kind of um, environments do we create um, and do we, are we actually potentially undermining building blocks for sustainable peace 
um, by the delivery of, of humanitarian aid, for example, in the immediate um, in the immediate term. I think there are some some key challenges that have already um, arisen from the conversation, and that I just want to highlight from the perspective of the peace actor, right? Which, which I'm, I'm not, um, I am from, from the inter-peace perspective, but I'm also not, um, I don't want to also sort of say that this is what all of the peace builders out there would, would, probably, would probably frame it as. But I think there is um, a, a perceived tension between humanitarian principles and actions for peace. And I think this stems from perhaps Different, um, different understandings and interpretations and sometimes definitions um, of what peace means. Um, and I think here, what we have found useful in our different um, conversations and dialogue with both development and humanitarian actors has been trying to distinguish um, between what we, would, what we would call capital P, peace, big P, and small P. Um, and this is it's quite an interesting parallel with uh, with Ella's um, definition of sort of capital H and and small H humanitarian. I think big P peace can be interpreted as providing security, um, elite level or sort of high level mediation processes, political peace um, at at those levels, which can indeed and has been highlighted very very eloquent from the different colleagues being in contrast and intention with humanitarian principles. But when we come to looking at what can be defined as small p interventions that have to do much more with social cohesion, um, trust, um, and more broadly speaking resilience, I think we can find a little bit more points of convergence in our, in our conversations. And sometimes I think um, we can also find ways in which we are, well, we find, we talk about similar things perhaps, by using uh, using different different words, so picking up from from what others have already talked about, you know, accountability to affected populations or wanting to be sensitive to cultural norms and ways uh, and ways of living of communities, for example, is at the heart of understanding conflict dynamics and 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 being conflict sensitive um, uh, as a, as a start. I think just. To, to move on to more of the opportunities and maybe points to discuss to discuss and to reflect upon in terms of in terms of ways um, in which we can bridge a little bit these uh, these gaps and, and and differences is I think there is certainly a need to understand each other a little bit more and um, I was recently talking with some colleagues from ICRC actually here in Geneva and we we agreed on the fact that we might need a little bit of a dictionary to interpret and understand what each of us means. By different different words, uh, and I know that in the HDP Nexus sort of space, we talk about trilingualism uh, of, of you know understanding with what, what de development actors talk about humanitarians and and peace building actors. So actually having more of these these conversations that we're having today to really see what are the preoccupations and concerns at the heart of what we do, and how we can build um, build upon each other's networks and capacities and access. Uh, which are different and has to have to be recognized as such. Um, I think what we are positing here and what we're sort of arguing for is not for humanitarians to become peace builders or development actors to become peace builders, but perhaps a way to approach the HDP nexus is also looking at stronger collaboration. Yes, understanding perhaps what we each have to offer, but it is also about a little bit how we do things. And I think some of the some of the actors that are represented across this virtual room have access and opportunities to to impact um, positively um, different communities by supporting and providing aid, but potentially also potentially also creating creating horizontal trust um, between different communities that whose trust has been has been broken down. And I think to provide an example that. Um, is perhaps you know complex, of course, but I think there was there was some lessons that were learned from responses to the Ebola crisis in Eastern DRC, where some humanitarian actors were actually faced with backlash from the communities, perhaps because of a of of difficulty in understanding the the subtle and nuanced dynamics of what was 
um, of what the dynamics were indeed in these communities, but actually understanding that a little bit more also provided um, actually avenues for stronger or sort of more efficient responses um, that actually, uh, you know, reached the, the populations in need and actually also some, some efficiency and, and effectiveness in, in building trust and social cohesion in the communities themselves. Um, I think I, I just may want to want to leave it leave it there. Um, perhaps my main message, indeed, being that you know there is perceived tensions, um, and I think we may need to go break down a little bit those perceptions to begin with, um, in, in order to understand how to better actually integrate peace in um, in nexus approaches, and from a peace builder perspective and a peace building perspective, also understanding what else. What, how we can ourselves adopt more protection and rights-based approaches, uh, which is maybe a conversation that hasn't yet happened um, in terms of how we can be uh, more humanitarian or development uh, responsive, um, understanding that peace building is a, is a multidimensional uh, endeavor and it is not linear. Thank you very much. Thank you, Georgia. Uh, for a number of reasons, I wanted to thank you. Uh, firstly, because uh, one of the things that we're seeing with the humanitarian development peace nexus is exactly that, that it's often seen as a humanitarian endeavor first, a development endeavor second, and a peace uh, endeavor third. And the words that you just said, that it's not linear, that doesn't one doesn't follow the other, but the fact that they have to be done at the same time is of, of paramount importance. The other thing that I wanted to uh, really point out was that uh, that you as an NGO, uh, uh, in a sense, just like MSF, have a, a huge role to play. This is not just left uh, to the governments or the United Nations. This is not just an intergovernmental affair. Um, and that social cohesion and bringing people together uh, is important at, at all levels. I also wanted to pick up on, on both your point and Ella's point about the big piece or the little piece or the big humanitarian or the small humanitarian frankly for a lot of us a lot of you in the audience this is going to be uh, a foreign language to you and it's very much an insider type of definition or differentiation that we're making and what we have to realize is uh, that perhaps we are creating these barriers between us ourselves um, in just defining or boxing ourselves into different categories. And what we should perhaps try to do is to think beyond that and, and just think about the fact that a lot of the people who are being assisted don't care who is assisting them and whether they have a label of being humanitarian development or peace or whether they are government NGO or UN or whether they are uh, the national government or whoever else. Uh, they just want to be helped and actually uh, most people don't want to be helped at all. They just want to be back on their feet and to live their life as they used to. And that's where we have to realize that we all have to work to our comparative advantage. Um, and one thing that the Nexus approach is trying to do is, is actually be common sense in the sense that we're not asking everybody to do everything. We're not asking MSF to be a development actor and a peace actor. Uh, uh, UNDP cannot be a core humanitarian actor, but each of us, should be able to do what is our comparative strength, but to do so in the knowledge of what the other silos are doing. And that knowledge sharing and that uh, ability to not compete with each other, but collaborate with each other is really at the crux of where we are with the humanitarian development peace nexus approach and what we're trying to push. Um, what I would like to do now is to open the floor uh, up to uh, the audience and just to see uh, what has uh, come up and, and how we can get the panelists engaged. Um, as we wait for questions uh, to, to form from the uh, audience, maybe I'll kick off with a question of my own, um, which is that uh, of, of humanitarian principles. Um, so my question to the panelists is, uh, are humanitarian principles an asset or a hindrance to the HTP Nexus approach? Are there instances where humanitarian principles and humanitarian space are being used as an excuse or, or, uh, or an obstacle uh, 
to not work uh, across the nexus? Uh, and if so, how do we overcome this? Uh, again, I'll put this into the chat as well, just in case uh, it's easier to refer to. Um, but maybe I would pass the, the floor uh, first to Ella uh, for you to give us a, a nice uh, thought-provoking uh, feedback. And then I'll pass on to the other colleagues before, uh, before we then open up to audience questions. Ella, over to you. Thanks. Um, thank you for that question. Um, as MSF, I will have to completely object to the way it was framed and reframe it to suit um, the way my, my organization operates, um, which is that it's not that humanitarian um, principles are a hindrance, they are a necessity. It's the only way that we can work in conflict settings. It's the only way that we can build trust with communities. It's the only way that governments will allow us to work. And it's the only way that we have protection under international humanitarian law to work in those spaces. So it's not, this isn't an option for MSF. These principles are a necessity. They are the foundation for how, why, and where we work. Um, in terms of being used as an excuse, if you are violating humanitarian principles, that's the time in MSF where we start to reevaluate if we are with, if we should continue that work. So if we cannot work in accordance with, with our principles, we start to have the conversation, do we stop this project? Do we change the, the location that we're working because we can't work in a principled approach? Um, or do we change um, who is working here and who we are serving? Or do we just stop working altogether? Um, so it's not so much that it's an excuse. Those are the tools. Those are the, the sort of necessary conditions. Um, for us to to work in in a conflict setting. So, and I I don't want to give the sense that all the principles are sort of fragile things kept in a glass case, and if something's missing, you can't operate. No, but they are tools that are used by humanitarians. And if you empty the toolbox out, we can't do our job anymore. Back to you. Thank you, Ella. Maybe if I could ask uh, Colin first, and then uh, Maki to respond. Colin, because obviously ICRC works only in conflict settings. And then Maki, A, because you're in Papua New Guinea that has the combination of natural disasters and the complexity of the insecurity. I'd love to hear your feedback about the practicalities of, of wanting or continuing to or want to work while still adhering to, to the principles. Colin, over to you first. Um, my answer is that, uh, first of all, uh, like Ella, and I'm sure everyone else on this panel, I fully agree that we need humanitarian principles to be able to uh, operate. And for all the reasons that have been mentioned, I, I like to tell people, especially from my other um, professional journey uh, in development, that you know it's an existential issue, not only because of our core identity, but because it puts our staff at risk if there isn't an adherence to these principles. Uh, but I think two things can be true at the same time. They can be essential, but they can also be used as excuses. And what do I mean by that? Um, when I first joined the ICRC about three years ago, and there was interest in moving uh, somewhat into the middle ground of the nexus, Many people said, oh, we can't do this because it's against our principles. Now, one hears less of that now. Why is that? We hear less of it now because people understand that the two aren't necessarily incompatible. One does have to have red lines. For example, as of today, we do not accept funding from governments that are parties to the conflict. We accept funding only when it comes directly to us for the intended purposes. That's one of the sort of safeguards we have in place. But I do think that um, there is, there can be situations where we interpret uh, our NIHA or our principles in ways that are more about protecting our identity than serving people. And the flip side is true of development, that in my experience in that world, uh, it's sometimes very easy to say we are a development agency. We don't deal with crises. We don't deal with emergencies, maybe other than financial crisis. And those types of what I call convenient fig leaves sometimes uh, 
really um, are coming under pressure by simply the complexity of conflict situations and crisis situations today. So my, in brief, I think, yes, your, the premise of your answer is that, yes, we do need these, but we also need to be careful that they don't become excuses for simply staying the way we are, because that's comfortable. Thank you, Colin, for your thoughts. Um, Maki, over to you, Papua New Guinea. Thank you very much. Um, it's, a, it's a challenging question, but uh, the answer is, of course, yes. Uh, the same as Ella and then Colin said, the human, uh, sorry, fundamental principles is necessi necessary. And then that's the only we could uh, respect that really uh, no excuse to you know, avoid to operate without the fundamental principles. This is because of the uh, our national society. IFRC is a secretariat. We are working with national societies on the ground. They cannot leave the country. They have to be there all the time. To protect them is neutrality, to have access, and then impartiality to really reach the most vulnerable population. And particularly the Papua New Guinea, we have uh, more than 1,000 clans and more than 800 languages. So only people could access is our volunteers. Without the principles, they are in danger at risk. Um, so it's really the short answer is really necessary. And then uh, for the fundamental principles for our um, humanitarian operation and also human, uh, the development work both. And excuses, mm, I'm not sure. This is a, um, unfortunately I don't have any answer for um, or experience for that. And also I'm come, I've been working in the Middle East for seven years and coming to Papua New Guinea. It's totally different context, but still um, we are really observing uh, the situation and also the, our principles always with us to, to do the work. Um, yep, I think, so the trust, access, and also uh, local action is a fundamental principle as I pretty much uh, yeah, literally fundamental for us. Over. Uh, thank you, Maki. Uh, in the meantime, I'm thankful to uh, two audience members that have uh, posted their questions in the chat. Um, and I want to tackle the first one, which is from Katsuhiro Koide from Adra, Japan, which is really about measurement in the sense that uh, we all talk about working, wanting to work across the nexus in one manner or the other, based on our agency's mandates and principles. Um, but uh, how do we actually operationalize it? What are the fundamental tools that we use and how do we measure it? Also in, in terms of indicators, how do we actually demonstrate success to a certain extent? Uh, Georgia, I wanted to get your viewpoints from the peace side first, uh, and, then, and then come back to you again, Maki, because a, because of your experience in the Middle East, but also because you're there operationally on the ground and you could perhaps give us a good example of where you've seen uh, the Red Cross movement and your partners uh, work and measure uh, the, the progress, uh, at least the way you see it on the Nexus. Uh, Georgia, first, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, it's, a, it's a great question, actually. And um, we've, we've tried to put some thinking into this as, as interpiece, in particular, um, when we have partnered with and we are partnering with various organizations across the, the humanitarian and development sort of uh, spectrum and sectors to think through how their work actually also can be can potentially contribute to to peace. So there's we talked about operationalization and tools and measurements so quickly on 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 these three points in terms of operationalization I think for from our perspective. The very, the very first step um, in, in, in interventions and specifically, you know, even in, in longer term um, interventions and presence is obviously understanding the context and actually a comprehensive peace and conflict analysis will underline and highlight um, issues that have to do with humanitarian needs as well as development needs for communities themselves. So for us, one tool is indeed actually not so much a mandate driven approach and analysis, but really just looking at 
the complexity of a certain situation and all its different facets. And as I say this, I also just wanted to highlight perhaps my answer to the question before, which I realize I'm not position, in a good position to, to provide, but I do think that humanitarian principles are an asset for an HDP nexus approach, quote unquote, because, because of it, they do actually provide access um, and uh, to, to, to various actors where maybe some of us don't. Um, as well. So I think that's really key uh, to, to highlight and understand. But in order to be impartial, I think understanding the context it, itself needs to be paramount, right? Also, as, as was mentioned in Papua New Guinea, various languages, different communities, how do we understand their interactions? Are we making sure that we're being impartial vis-a-vis -vis their relationships? So that's number one in terms of understanding the context. And based on that, I think that's that is the key kind of stepping stone to understand how each of us can contribute and provide the capacities that we do have to make a difference and, 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 um, and respond to needs based on our capacities, networks, mandates, access. Um, and that's where we can develop sort of uh, the want to throw a buzzword in there, but theories of change of how we can each of us actually develop programs and initiatives and work that can address uh, fundamental needs, development needs, and peace uh, needs. And, um, and, and insofar as measurement goes, well, we in, well, in the peace building field, decades of thought has gone into how we pe measure peace building. You can't just say, here, we've built a school, um, tick a box. It's much more complex than that. And there's a couple of things that I think are fundamental in, in, in measuring kind of peace uh, contributions is, is the question of trust. And we have, each of us have actually mentioned it. So I think this is for me also a way of, of converging, right? And, and, and build, um, bridging a bit um, the, the gaps that may exist and between different silos. So measuring trust um, between communities and community members and more and more potentially also vertical trust that may exist or have been eroded um, with, with the governments and, and, and authorities of, a different, of different contexts. It's easier said than done, but there's uh, various ways in which we have approached it. I'm very happy to also share resources um, that we have put forward and also other peace building organizations have. Thanks. Thank you, Georgia. Uh, over to you, Maki, maybe a good operational viewpoint from yourself. Yep, uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is a, uh, also an interesting question and it's really um, honored to answer or to just to share that some experience in the uh, Middle East, maybe Lebanon and Syria. For, for instance, in the Lebanon, uh, we have I explained in the first presentation that we have four crises that are the biggest crises at the same time. And how to how to reach out the last mile population or even the core population to reach out. So that's the co collaboration that definitely the human HDB nexus is the centered and then also the people centered approach and a cluster system and a cluster mechanism and a co coordination mechanism should be in place and also everybody respect it and then work together. So for the measurement, um, the risk mapping and also the um, stakeholder mapping. So who's doing what to make it clear and then not com 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 yes, competition, as everybody said, everybody has a strength. And they also, particularly Red Cross, has a strongest net, uh, network and then there's a access in an entire country. So there's some areas really other national, uh, the stakeholders uh, and the partners couldn't reach. So that's the, uh, the, uh, the uh, our national society, Lebanese Red Cross, could deliver the, uh, all the humanitarian um, aid as well as development work. So then that's the measurement that indicator should be the um, number of people reached uh, by area or by a sector. And then that could be uh, measuring in a way that um, to the, uh, as a result of the, 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 this nexus or the coordination to, to cover all the population in need and the particular most vulnerable population by uh, um, all, the uh, all the stakeholders and then the most difficult parts, the national society could reach out. And then if you remember the, one of the picture I showed in the presentation, that's a good example. So that's the, during the COVID crisis and then during the, um, at the same time, civil unrest, the demonstrators are blocking all the way, the burning tires and it's making a, a noise and it really uh, harmful act. However, um, 
they expect Lebanese Red Cross to give you a, give you a space to reach the wounded, injured people. So that's the trust and, and also respect and uh, also neutrality, impartiality as a result of that thing. And then also um, uh, the Syria, Syria crisis already 12 years, but the most uh, the uh, busiest time in 2012, 2014, the most the, the, uh, finance support goes to UN agencies. However, uh, the implementation was pretty much done by 60% uh, convoy, the food delivery, et cetera, was done by uh, City Arab Recursant. This is also the, this, uh, part of the, uh, the Nexus. They are coordinating, they're working together to reach out the most needed people. So uh, to measure also the number shows that the impact and then the uh, outcome of this Nexus and uh, also the, uh, the, our strengths and also other people's co cooperation and collaboration. And um, so that was the also Syria case. We had a good example in the past and also hopefully continuing doing that, but uh, the financial crisis doesn't help, but uh, that's the, uh, um, just one of the example in the Syria context that uh, our national society and the UN agencies, donor society, donor uh, societies is supporting each other to really implement in, a, in both government control area and then others over. Thank you, uh, Maki. Um, I want to take the question from uh, Masayo Eguchi of Hiroshima City University, but I wanted to give it a little bit of a twist. Um, her question that she has posed to us as the panel is, uh, how do you think the Triple Nexus challenge, challenges each humanitarian principle and which humanitarian principle is the most controversial uh, in our opinion? Um, what I wanted to ask was, uh, you know, which humanitarian principle perhaps is being most misused um, in your view? Um, uh, and, and where is it perhaps where there might be contradictions within humanitarian principles or within the principles themselves? Uh, we've seen it, for example, we, we, you know, Colin, you spoke about the NIA, uh, Ella, you spoke about the, I believe the five principles from the MSF side, I believe Ocha has four, Georgia, from your side, you spoke about uh, the do no harm principle at the most basic level. Um, are there contradictions between these principles where one perhaps juxtaposes with the other? Uh, I wanted to first uh, go to uh, you, Ella, and then pass on to Colin, if that's okay. Ella, over to you. Sure. I mean, I think it's a really good a really good question. Um, yes, the principles are in conflict with each other. Within MSF, we spend um, hours and hours every year having multiple debates over how to resolve um, that those issues. It's, um, again, I think what we, we need to remember that the principles are tools so that we can deliver aid to people in distress. They're not meant to block people from getting access. And I think the, the comment of people don't care which organization, whether it's an emergency organization or a development organization is delivering aid, that's true. They don't care the color of your t-shirt, but they do care if they're receiving humanitarian aid or not. And, and so we have to be very careful that we're using the tools in order to uh, deliver humanitarian aid, in order to access populations. And um, and so that that conflict is always going to be there in terms of independence, for example. A government might say, if you want to work in that area, you have to accept that, for example, in Eastern Congo, that the FR de Se is going to accompany um, your vehicle. Well, it's not okay to for MSF to be escorted by a government military when that government is a party to a conflict. And when we are delivering in impartial, neutral humanitarian aid, so that those issues, um, that's an example of sort of where those those principles can be in um, in conflict. Medical ethics and humanity would say, do whatever you need to do to get people the medical care, and and yet the neutrality, uh, the impartiality, and the independence would say, no, we can't we can't work in in these circumstances. Um, I think in terms of 
um, how the nexus challenges. I think the challenges are more often seen in the independence element of the principles in that the nexus is very much donor driven. So the donors, the government donors who, um, who have the most power in the nexus set a humanitarian agenda and they say, these are countries, these are contexts, these are populations that are priorities for us. And that means that some countries are not going to get aid because they are not politically aligned with the United States of America, for example, or they will be less of a priority. And so I think that independence element is, is probably the one that is most challenged by the nexus framework. And it's because of how the nexus distributes power within the humanitarian sector. Back to you. Thank you, Ella. And maybe Colin, over to you, perhaps as the uh, as the last intervention from the field before we just do a last round of uh, of uh, concluding remarks from all of us panelists. Colin, over to you. Colin, you're on mute. My apology. I'll I'll respond to it maybe from a slightly higher level as opposed to being maybe. Uh, an ICRC issue, rather more a sort of slightly broader issue that emerged in the context of the Ukraine crisis, when in Switzerland, as you know, there was this intense debate about neutrality, and um, and where uh, there were some questions about whether by emphasizing neutrality, um, the Swiss government. And, and for all kinds of other reasons, um, institutions like ICRC were not recognizing that there was one party that, if you like, was the aggressor and one that was, in fact, simply responding to the aggression. Um, and that, of course, has other implications for the other principles as well. So I do think, at least in this particular case, there was this example where there was a sense that neutrality meant endorsing some sort of wrongdoing and some might go even further and say uh, might have been endorsing violations of humanitarian law and somehow trying to skate above uh, all of these considerations. Um, so that's an example uh, in my mind, which um, is perhaps one of the things that in this kind of newer environment where everything is now heavily politicized, everything uh, is politicized, that also our, the legitimacy, even of an approach that is well-meaning, um, where we have to be mindful that uh, these high-sounding, well um, established uh, guiding principles may not always resonate uh, with those we are trying to assist. I've used the Ukraine example, but this also begin, begins to show its head in other ways. The localization agenda is partly an issue around um, our legitimacy um, and the extent to which now some of the things that we do we in our community meeting are being seen more as sort of Western imposition or Western creation of, of dependency. Um, I don't think that these sort of underlying trends and examples are extremely pervasive, but they are becoming, in my view, uh, considerations which we will increasingly have to take into account. So in short, the principles are ones to which we are firmly committed, but we also have to be mindful that we are vulnerable notwithstanding to misinterpretations, to misinformation, to disinformation, to ways that actually undermine uh, what we are intended to do based on these principles. Thank you, Colin. Um... With that, uh, first of all, I wanted to give a big thanks to the audience for listening, for the panelists for their remarks, uh, particularly for those of you who are doing this in the middle of the night. I know that uh, um, it's it's a many many hours away from Japan, but we wanted to make sure that uh, that uh, certainly this important audience was able to to get the perspectives from the different actors wherever they are, whether it's global, regional.
uh, field, whether it's uh, at headquarters, whether it's your uh, an NGO or the UN or the Red Cross movement, and also whether you your humanitarian development of peace. And that's that's the beauty of this panel here. And again, it would have been uh, the cherry on the cake would have been to have uh, our colleague also from Sudan, from Jaika, uh, who actually demonstrates for us the, the, the difficulties of doing this job. Uh, he is probably there, uh, you know, trying to reap the benefits and the fruits of what was uh, seemingly uh, a peace process that was faltering, but certainly going in what we thought was a positive direction. And yet this has been all put to test uh, in the last couple of days with the fighting that, that is going on there. What I would like to do is just to give an opportunity to all of you to uh, say anything else that you may want to uh, in a minute or less. Um, and after which we will pass the floor back to um, uh, the organizers. So if I could just do it in the same order that we spoke. So Maki first, Colin second, Ella third, and uh, last but not least, Georgia. And Maki, over to you. Thank you very much. So this is a great uh, opportunity to learn from the panelists and also the Romano and also the audience. It's a great uh, honor to be here. And then it's a really, we think about humanitarian uh, principles and then also humanitarian nexus to how to uh, deliver in Papua New Guinea and other countries. But are we together for humanity and we continue to focus on the people centered and also to reach out to the last mile population. So thank you very much for uh, listening and also the inviting me. Thank you. Thank you, Maki-san. Colin, over to you. Maybe two final points of reflection, one of which I touched on during my immediate uh, past intervention. I think we focus a lot on the principles, uh, and rightly so. They are fundamental to who we are in the humanitarian space. I do think that, like in the development world, we will increasingly face issues about our legitimacy, which is to what extent do we actually represent um, not only, if you like, the moral elements of our mandate, but that we actually have something to offer which really respects people's uh, dignity and that we ourselves are not somehow tainted by those who are funding us, irrespective of whether it's public or private. And for me, that's something that um, is giving me pause in my role and increasingly trying to understand how we can be more sensitive to these issues, which are increasingly surfacing partly because of social media, partly because we are dealing with a very different information landscape. So principles have animated the conversation today. I think legitimacy is something that we will have to grapple with in due course. Very true, Colin. Thank you. Um, hello, over to you. Um, I I want to go back to the the idea of root causes, um, and and say that you know one of my educational backgrounds mm -hmm. is public health, and public health is all about root causes. But um, as we often say in MSF, we're not a public health organization, we're an emergency medical organization. And root causes is a political narrative. And it's a focus on how governments can better meet the needs of their populations. It's not for me and it's not for anyone in MSF to tell a population um, how to address their root causes. That's really something that people need to do independently from humanitarian emergency actors. We, are, we aren't the right people for that. Um, and it, it would definitely fall outside of a principled humanitarian approach um, be, because it does go to political organization. Um, on um, and sort of the final, the final remark is more along the lines of the fact that we are increasingly see a, seeing a loss of ability to respond effectively to humanitarian emergencies. We are seeing more and more gaps in, in the acute emergency phase we are seeing fewer actors who have the ability and the willingness, frankly, to work in difficult contexts. Um, and, and more and more organizations who are really focusing more on the, the longer term development needs um, and leaving people essentially to die in the acute phase. We are seeing it in Eastern DRC right now where there is a massive number of people who are internally displaced who are without um, food and water and shelter and basic um, needs, and there is almost no response to those needs. Um, 
I think we also saw Afghanistan as a really good example of how um, how we fail the population. So in Afghanistan, the basic services that the population relied on were organized through the NATO-backed government. And when that government fell and the Taliban took over, all of those public services essentially stopped because nobody knew how to work through a different government. And, no, and frankly, the donors are not willing to work with the Taliban. They're not willing to recognize them as a legitimate government. And they're not willing to, to work through them. And so what it means is MSF and, and ICRC continue to work. Everyone else evacuated their staff. Um, and it's taken weeks and months for emergency needs to be addressed again. Um, there are still huge gaps in Afghanistan. And it will take years for the development and the peace um, actors to come back um, if they do, in fact, come back. And so there's really... Um, we have to find a way to meet those acute needs and not lose that capacity within, within our sector. Thanks. I think what you're saying Ella, about us essentially handicapping ourselves by knowingly or unknowingly putting ourselves in one camp, I think is, is, is extremely irrelevant. And I think this point that we don't have the time to discuss today about how is development done in a context where the government is not legitimate is is an, is an existential question for the development system as a whole. Um, and perhaps we have to part that for some other time. Uh, George, uh, over to you, and after which we will uh, kindly close the panel. Thank you very much. Maybe one thought that I, I'd like to just leave um, the conversation with, which is that I think in developing thinking around the HDP nexus and the, the idea of having to be more coherent across sectors and silos, we have, I think, unintendedly perhaps created even more um, challenges in constructing something that is that sounds heavy, that may be, as you also said, Romano, a new language for some. Uh, but I think we really have to remember that across all of our um, agendas, or if, if that's the right word, but at least are the work that we do in our sectors and where we are present, we're talking about people's lives. Um, and I think that there's, there's obviously, you know, acute crises and needs arise because of issues that have to do with um, challenges to peace, challenges to development, and that they are systemic, and that therefore we each have a role to play. And I think, if anything, we have to share more knowledge, lessons, even challenges, and, and be much more open about those and see where we can each leverage um, each other's capacities. And as I said, again, access and legitimacy where we do have it. Um, and or when we can construct it or um, are able to build upon it in order to actually respond to multidimensional, multifaceted, sometimes very acute needs uh, of people. Um, thank you. Thanks for having me uh, today. And thanks for moderating the panel um, so well, Roman. Thank, thank you so much. much. And with that, I actually want to thank the organizers for having us from such a diverse background. I think uh, we certainly benefited from speaking with uh, or speaking to an audience that is diverse from the ones that we usually get, certainly from my side in New York. Uh, we hope to keep the dialogue open. And uh, one small plug from my side, and I think that Suya and others will be able to pass on the link later, but I am the manager of something that's called the Nexus Academy, in which our main uh, focus is to try to improve trilingualism, trilingualism of the three languages of H, D, and P. Uh, just so that we understand that we are reaching out to the same people, that we're trying to have the same goals to a certain extent, that we're each trying to work to our comparative advantage, but to, to work and help optimize our own work, we just have to be better aware of what each other do. And so it just, it's, a, it's a small course that's done virtually uh, four times a year, uh, which I would encourage a lot of you, if at all possible, to come and uh, 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 attend. Uh, and if not, there is an online course as well, which you would be welcome to do. And again, I will post the links and ask uh, Tatsuya and Yoshino to, uh, to circulate around. But with that, I really wanted to thank you all. And uh, I'm sure that the recording will be available for everyone to watch. Thank you again so much. Have a good day Bye. and an evening to everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.